Our work is based on the dual facets of globalization. It focuses on helping more people in more places tap into globalization's benefits while coping with its burdens. We call this smart globalization, and it informs our approach to many issue areas, from global health to climate change, from food security to urbanization. These issues and the challenges inherent to them have rapidly evolved, and they've become increasingly tangled with one another in this, the 21st century. In fact, some of these challenges are so deeply complex and interconnected that they require a new way of thinking, perhaps a new way of acting, and indeed even a new vocabulary to make sense of them. One of the foremost thinkers in this space is Dr. Jeffrey Conklin, director of the Cognexus Institute, who drew on the earlier work of design theorist Horace Riddle to describe this new brand of interconnected global challenge as wicked problems. The wicked problems then require wicked creativity and wicked innovation. Of course, Conklin notes, solutions therefore are not just one-shot operations. You can't learn about the problem without trying the solutions, and every solution you try costs you something and may have lasting unintended consequences. You might be thinking, given the inherent difficulties of wicked problems, that perhaps we should just focus on those problems that aren't so wicked, problems that are challenging but are more straightforward, more linear. I would argue that that is true in some circumstances, but that more and more often in the 21st century, we may no longer have that luxury. That fact has dramatically altered the nature of our work at the Rockefeller Foundation. We've learned, in other words, that wicked problems demand systems thinking and bro brokering critical partnerships to achieve sustainable solutions. So we no longer typically innovate linearly, we try to innovate systemically. This process has helped us to formulate a number of wicked solutions. Let's look at India. 400 million people living without electricity. There are obvious humanitarian, social, and political problems associated with such massive, entrenched poverty. There are also the attendant environmental, health, and financial costs of so many of them living without power, burning two billion gallons of kerosene for heat and light. Of course, the lack of an electric grid serving poor communities is a drag on India's otherwise strong, maybe exceptional in some areas, economic growth. One often cited measure of that growth is the country's skyrocketing mobile phone industry. But then consider the industry's quarter million cell towers, which are in those same impoverished communities that lack electricity, being powered by dirty diesel fuel generators. Problems don't get much more wicked than this. Enter what we're calling our acronym SPEED, Smart Power for Environmentally Sound Economic Development. SPEED is one example of a wicked problem solution to this issue. By diagnosing the entire system first, and then recognizing that those cell towers I mentioned could actually be used as the anchor tenants for developing and sustaining new mini utilities that would be based on alternative energy to be environmentally friendly. They could then, the mini utilities, also serve the needs of poor villagers without electricity and reduce carbon emissions and poverty at the same time. Rockefeller has helped to bring the multiple stakeholders together, including mobile phone-based station owners, power companies, a very well-placed and influential environmentally focused business association in India and host villages to launch new energy service companies that use the towers as anchor tenants. These new micro utilities replace those diesel fuel generators I mentioned with renewable energy like biofuels or solar panels. But in addition, and here maybe is the most critical part of the wicked problem solution, the business model also fo focuses explicitly on providing local village electrification from the grid and training and jobs in these emerging companies for people who live in those villages. This wicked problem solution has struck on a model that provides clean power, enhances sustainability, and fights joblessness and rural poverty 
all at the same time. We think this is the future of philanthropy. We think this is the future of corporate social responsibility, the future of enlightened government policy. This is the future of globalization. Now, what about impact investing? Because that's, there's been a lot of talk over our two days here about how markets work and how they do and don't point us in the right directions. Impact investing, as, as we define it and, and others in the field more typically, are those investments that are looking for at least a double bottom line return. So they want a financial return, and they are certain that they want a financial return, so they do that unabashedly. Um, but they are also looking for a very significant social return. Our own initiative thus far has been trying to create the infrastructure for this industry to take off. So we've created a global impact investors network so that um, the JP Morgans and the um, Singapore Wealth Fund, et cetera, are really talking and sharing a common platform so that everybody doesn't have to invent it. Um, we have funded the development of rating agencies. So the idea was that you would have kind of an S&P and a Mood or a Moody's for the social impact the way they're rating the fina potential financial risk and impact. And again, this would do the same thing. So a lot of innovation around um, those metrics, which we think are also necessary for the field to take off. The second thing is that I do believe, and Rockefeller is actually doing some funding here, that we actually should try to incent government itself to be more innovative. It is the most risk averse sector um, there is no percentage for being innovative. In fact, there's often a penalty. We think if we can make governments feel proud about being at the cutting edge of innovation, rather than always feeling like they're the drag on the system, um, that we can accelerate the pace of change here. Everyone in this room is interested in figuring out how to make change happen within their organizations. What advice can you give to them? I really do think diagnosing the problem, the whole system, is really a critical part of that. Often it's in defining the problem in the right way that you effect the best change, rather than immediately thinking about what the solu right solution is. So spend a little more time diagnosing the problem, bring other stakeholders in so that you're sure that you've got the right problem before you try solving it. And then, of course, um, have the courage to take risks, to innovate, to make some mistakes and, and break some glass. You know, don't put yourselves in environments or in jobs um, where you're punished for trying to be a change maker. Uh, I think um, it's, it's very important to uh, keep yourself true to that course. Um, if, if in fact, you know, there's lots of problems in the world and lots of organizations that benefit from your aspiration to make change um, and you can push up to a certain point and I think that's really important because that's what gets organizations going. But if you feel honestly in your own heart that that's not an organization that's amenable to change, then you should change where you are.